California Institute for Mental Health's KDA webinar series. This project is funded through a contract with the Department of Health Care Services. Today's webinar is Engaging Parents and Families in the Implementation of Pathways to Well-Being, or also known as KDA. Before I turn today's presentation over to our first presenter, we have three polling questions we would like you to answer. This helps us get a better understanding of our audience today. So now we're going to go to the first question. Please tell us where you work. A, state, county, state or county child welfare. B, state or county behavioral or mental health. C, a contract agency or community-based organization providing services. D, an education and training organization or other. We have 18 state and county child fair workers. We have 43% state and county behavioral health or mental health. 25% contract agencies or CBO providing services. We have 7% education and training organizations and 77% others. Great. Thanks, Camille. So now tell us the nature of your work. A, you work directly with children and families as a caseworker, clinician, wraparound facilitator, et cetera. B, as a supervisor or manager. C, as a family partner or peer provider. D, as a consultant, trainer, or technical assistance provider, or E, other. So in terms of the response, we have, for people who work directly with children and families, it's 16%. Supervisors and managers, 52%. Family partner, peer provider, 3%. Consultant or TA provider, 16%. And the others are 13%. And then we have one final question for you. So in your county, do you have a formal parent partner or family partner program? And the answer is either A, yes, B, no, or C, don't know. All right, so the answers are yes, 66% have a formal parent partner or a family partner program, no is 24%, and 10% don't know. Great, thank you very much for your input. So I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Rich Wisegal of Shared Vision Consultants. Thanks, Kim, and welcome, everyone. I'm going to begin today's presentation with a few brief introductory slides. So, why are we focusing on parent and family engagement? Well, the KDA core practice model is very intentional that parents and caregivers should be included as partners at all levels of the system. Their voices should inform policy development, program planning and implementation, and individual child and family services. The creation of this webinar came about as the result of counties asking for more information on how to build effective and sustainable partnerships with parents. The KDA settlement agreement has been a catalyst for both child welfare and mental health to become more integrated, holistic, and comprehensive in meeting the needs of children, youth, and families. The foundational values and principles you see here come straight from the core practice model guide. They are not new. They have been reflected in the best practice of both child welfare and mental health for many years, most notably in the development and implementation of systems of care, of wraparound, 
and of other team-based planning models. One of the important lessons learned about family and parent involvement is this. Teaming with families in the child welfare and mental health system is greatly facilitated when parent partners are there to engage parents and other caregivers right from the start and to ensure that the concerns and needs of parents, along with their skills and strengths, their bright ideas, and in-the-trenches experience are fully represented. Next slide. Family-run organizations and family and parent partner programs have been studied for the past two decades or so, although rigorous research is rare. What has come from close examination are some of the essential elements to developing successful family and parent partner programs noted on this next slide here. The first bullet can be translated like this, show me the money. In other words, if it's not in the budget, it won't happen. Family-run organizations and family partner programs don't just happen. They have to be paid for. Successful counties have line items in their budget for family partners and contracts with family-run organizations. The second bullet really is about making sure your family leaders and family partner staff reflect the diversity of cultures in your county population. In order to do that, you have to engage the various communities. And in order to do that, you have to get out of your office and go to them. But that's probably a topic for a whole other webinar. Third, parents with lived experience in the system must be there to mentor and support other parents. And those parent partners are themselves going to need training and support to be effective. Fourth, make sure you have good clinical services available and accessible, such as trauma-informed and evidence-informed practices, as well as funding and resources for non-traditional supports and services. And finally, make sure families are sitting and participating fully at every table where decisions that affect their lives are made. Next slide. Today's presentation is only a snapshot. There is no way to do justice fully to uh, family, and parent, family partnership and family engagement in 90 minutes. So uh, if you need further information, we have made available all of the contact information for the pre presenters so that you can follow up with them as needed. And uh, Kim has already introduced, uh, excuse me, let me move on now to introduce our first presenters um, for today. They, uh, they were beginning with Contra Costa, and it is my pleasure to begin by introducing Judy Niddle. Ms. Niddle is the supervisor of the Contra Costa Family Engagement Unit. For almost 10 years, she has coordinated the Parent Partner Program there, a model which she researched, developed, and implemented, and which she has presented both locally and nationally. She also provides training and supervision to six parent partner staff. Joining Judy is Mary Lopez. Mary is a full-time parent partner who serves as a mentor, parent leader, and trainer, working with families who are currently involved with the child welfare system. She participates in foster parent orientation and pride training for new foster parents and recently presented a training on navigating the
Um, it seems we had a technical glitch and we're now reconnected and I am now introducing the Contra Costa presenters um, to present their part of this webinar. Thank you. Aside from the obvious challenges, KDA pre pre presents an opportunity for child welfare and children's mental health to revisit the really good work we have been doing and to consider how we can make it even better. And this is going to happen through collaboration and creative problem solving on both sides. One suggestion that we have is to incorporate parents into the decision making, into leadership roles, into mentoring roles to help other parents be able to navigate what can be really confusing systems. Whether you call them parent partners, parent advocates, family partners, cultural brokers, system navigators, these are parents who have the experience, the know-how, the wisdom, and the compassion to understand what other families are going through and to also perhaps identify some of the cracks that we have in the system. We really want to thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak with you today, to share some thoughts. You'll be given an opportunity later to answer some questions. And we want to hopefully inspire you a little bit with the vision of what this pioneering work can do. Both child welfare and mental health are doing great work and they're working very, very hard and have been for many years. But honestly, do you think that sometimes people just fall through the cracks? Do you think sometimes people don't get the service they need or they deserve in a timely fashion? Both Mary and Jennifer have experience with a system that, although it was set up, didn't quite meet their needs. And I'm going to turn some time over to them to talk to you about that. Hi, my name is Mary Lopez, and I am a parent partner with Children and Family Services, but I'm also a former child welfare um, client. Um, so I am a former client whose kids were removed due to my own substance abuse and addiction. I was offered all kinds of services that pretty much focused on me and what I needed to do to recover, um, overcome some of my obstacles, um, and get my kids back. Um, which happened. Um, I was well on my way to, um, to life changes, um, a better future, um, kids home, and my middle daughter hit her teenage years. And um, most of us would seem to think it was normal teenage um, behaviors out of control. But this is a kid that I loved so much but couldn't stand to be around. Um, that's hard to say, but I really couldn't stand to be around her because of a lot of her um, out of control behaviors, her mouthiness, um, her uncontrollableness, and it seemed like no matter what I did, there was um, there was no hope. Um, I never realized that the trauma that she was experiencing um, or what she had gone through. I noticed um, she was starting to cut herself and tried to hide it, but it became so severe that she couldn't hide it anymore. Um, and I didn't really know where to go. Um, I didn't know where to go for help. I've never experienced the mental health system. I didn't know really anything about it except for the stigma that was put behind mental health. You hear of mental health and a lot of us think um, it's such a negative thing. Um, and then when reaching out for help, it became such a challenge. Um, it, took, I, it took me doing a lot of my own research to um, even start some sort of help. I finally found a therapist that would be willing to see her. Um, I got her through those front doors, and I'd like to say that it was the beginning of um, some change for her, um, but it became even a longer road. She didn't click with a the therapist, and she maybe saw her maybe once or twice, maybe three times tops, um, and that was the end of therapy. I didn't have no one there on my side to help me navigate the system, where to go, um, can I change therapy? I mean, it already took us over six months to even get an appointment, let alone changing the therapist and to get her to even actually participate became really challenging. Um, I 
and I'm stuck. <laughs> so Mary's experience was one of being frustrated by the system. She didn't know what the options were. She didn't know where to turn to. She didn't know who to talk to. And sometimes she found that the people that she thought she could confide in actually um, didn't, didn't keep her, her things private. And then she found herself in even more trouble than she was to begin with. Nobody could explain the system to her, and she didn't know who to ask. Jennifer's experiences were a little bit different. Hi, my name is Jennifer Tuipolotu, and I'm the Family Services Coordinator for Hi, this is Jennifer Tuipolotu, Family Services Coordinator with Contra Costa County. I oversee the Family Partner Program, but I also started this work working for Judy, who just spoke, and uh, I was a CFS parent partner working for her a while ago. And how I got that job is because my husband and I both navigated the child welfare system. So while we were navigating the system, our children were placed in care foster care. And during the time that they were in care, my husband and I received parenting classes, drug and alcohol courses, and also therapy. However, our children didn't receive anything, and they were the ones who experienced the real trauma. So our kids were returned to us, and we weren't really equipped to parent their high needs. And one day, I got a phone call from the school that one of my, or that my child had been um, hospitalized, that he was 5150 from the school. And I've got to say that for me, the worst phone call, what, or the worst call that I got was not the knock at the door from CFS, but was the phone call from the hospital stating that my child wanted to kill himself. And I just had no idea what to do. I was totally not equipped to um, to even think about how to pick him up and bring him home and what to do at that point forward. What we were missing as we w w move forward with our KDA is we were missing mental health services for our children. As I look back and I think what could have been different and what could have been helpful is if our children were screened and then perhaps assessed for services for themselves because they clearly had some issues prior to them even going into foster care that we were completely unaware about. So um, with that said, Judy and I would like to continue to work a little bit on talking about what our programs are about and how we work together in our KDA um, implementation. Judy. 
One of the things that we've talked about is we've had conversations uh, being involved in KDA is how, how sad it is that things have to sometimes get to a critical point. Children have to be threatening to kill themselves. Children have to be running away and creating havoc at home and in their neighborhoods before we can get the much needed services to them. We have found that listening to the parents' voice, hearing these real stories, these real family situations, allows us to do a better job, to be more strategic in our thinking, and be able to offer supports and services that perhaps were not available in the past. Mary and Jennifer and so many people, their experiences help inform and help us change practice. They help us to do better work. And that's why we're here today. We're here to celebrate what's working well and to identify what's not and try to figure out ways to make it work better. One of the um, materials that I think that you were sent is a nuts and bolts worksheet. And that worksheet really is just to help guide your own conversation, whether you're in an, um, a county, whether you're in a, a community-based organization. If you're thinking about doing this kind of work, this raises some questions that you might want to consider. What, what I would hope is that as you sit down and have those conversations, you'll have a better idea of how you want to invite parents to participate with you in partnership in crafting what, what this is going to look like. The most important thing, I think, in developing a parent partner type program is having strong administrative support. When you start inviting parents to the table, you're really changing the culture of your agency. You're asking people to think about parents in a different way. And that can shake things up a little. People get uneasy. People get resistant. Maybe all of you eagerly embrace change, but some of us are a little bit more reticent than others. The message from our administration was, we're going to do this. Now make it happen. It wasn't, well, we're going to try it out and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, we might not do it. Or we're going to change some things. And we'll see how, how people react to it. It wasn't waffling at all. It was, we're going to do this. Now make it happen. These were energetic, positive, forward-thinking people who wanted to move in this direction and who were committed to collaborating well. We are on um, the slide that says Children and Family Services. And there are some core elements that really helped us as we figured out how to make this crazy thing work. We've been in existence now for about 10 years. And our job really is to help parents navigate the child welfare system or anything else that's getting in their way and that they need help with. Currently, I have six parent partners, three or two in each of our three offices. And their caseloads can range anywhere from 20 to 50 families. Um, but many times, that, that number is somewhat deceiving, because many times people are in um, domestic violence shelters, they may be in drug and alcohol treatment, so a lot of the hands-on stuff is being done by the program. We're there to kind of just make sure that everything's getting done and help them navigate the court system and everything else that they need to, to do to complete their case plan. We don't go into homes, we don't do home visits, and we don't transport clients. And really, we made that decision because if you're honest, you got to know that once we start transporting, we become a livery service. It's very convenient to say, well, just have the parent partners take them. Just have them do that. And that's not the unique role of the parent partner. So we don't transport, and we don't go to the home because it really isn't a good use of parent partner time, and there's no need for us to go into the home. 
And we also need to be mindful of creating boundaries, both with the families that we work with and also with the workers, um, social workers and child welfare, so that we maintain the integrity of the parent partner's role and we don't just become junior social workers. That was not the intent of what we do. Now, behavioral health has a, a somewhat different model, and Jennifer's going to speak to that. Sure, I'd be happy to, Judy. Thank you. And so with the behavioral health family partners, we are all folks who have had children that have navigated the system and have lived experience. And also, um, we've been in existence for about, uh, well, since 1998. Now, I have inherited the program. So those are those, I mean, there are folks there before me who um, were pioneers that have developed this program. And believe it or not, one of them actually was my family partner when I had wraparound services. And then another one um, became a mentor of mine um, later as we worked together. So it, I was very fortunate to learn the history and to hold the integrity of their program as I got into this position. So with that said, I'd like to say that we also have um, currently 10 to 12 family partners and um, we work um, rather in depth with the families. We work on wraparound teams um, which could be anywhere between 6 to 18 months with the family, and we could be visiting them um, weekly, bi-weekly, sometimes maybe a couple times during the week, depending upon the needs of the family and the child. We also have um, family partners who work with clinic families, and so that would be a referral from uh, a caseworker, excuse me, a case manager or a therapist who believes that the family could use um, some short-term um, solution-focused um, support to um, just get the family moving and going in a direction that supports the child. We also have eight um, bilingual um, family partner staff, and we are funded through Medi-Cal because our staff do do the Medi-Cal billing, and we also are funded through MHSA, thank you. And um, we do work in the homes, and we also um, do provide very limited transportation and that is only to accompany a parent um, and child or a parent to necessary appointments to um, support the family and to keep them stable in their homes. And so that's pretty much um, our program overall basics. It does go into depth, but of course we'd love to be able to answer questions um, beyond our webinar today for those who have them. The differences between the child welfare parent partners and those in mental health really demonstrate that this is not a one-size-fits-all kind of concept. We really try to tailor the service that we offer to the families that we serve. And if right now what they need is something short-term, solution-focused, immediate, we'll work on that. And then we can kind of put those long-term things um, on, the, you know, on the back burner and then bring them forward as it makes sense. One other thing, just a little piece of advice as, as you work on your worksheets or have these conversations, is figure out how you want to define success. You know, success can be defined in lots of different ways, but if we're defining our success based on what somebody else does, we're going to be disappointed a lot of the time. What do you have control over? What we chose to do was define success as making sure that our families are informed consumers, that they know what's going on, they know what their options are, and, and that they can make choices, that they're empowered to make choices in their own lives. Now, if your idea of success is everybody gets better and they live happily ever after, that can be your definition of success, and good luck with that. But we found that our, um, our goals had to be a little bit smaller than that and making, just making sure that parents knew the, the consequences of the choices that they were making. As you contemplate having a parent partner program, you need to think about sustainability. Um, how are you going to do this after that first pot of money is gone? How are you going to blend funds? Where is that money going to come from? What about your hiring practices? Are you going to be able to hire people who have a past, or are you going to have to figure out a different way to pay them? because they probably cannot be county employees if they've been felons. 
what we do for child welfare is um, we have a contract with the Child Abuse Prevention Council. They take a small administrative fee, and the parent partners are actually hired through the Child Abuse Prevention Council. We know that everybody comes with a past, and frankly, that's their strength, but that is also what makes them difficult to hire. So you have to figure out a way to do that. You also have to um, figure out who you should hire as your parent partners. And what we found worked well was to ask staff. They know clients that they've had in the past who have done well, who have gotten it, and they, they're happy to share those names, and now they're part of the process. Now they've got some ownership. We also are excited to be able to hire second-generation parent partners, people who've had a parent partner, and now they can be a parent partner. And that's really exciting, and it's really satisfying to see that kind of growth. You also have to think about how you're going to supervise the parent partners, what kind of training they're going to need, what kind of um, message you want them to have. One of the things that we work really hard on in Contra Costa County is having them work as a team. And quite frankly, some of our parent partners have never had one person in their life they could trust. So we work on building trust and looking out for each other and having each other's back and knowing nobody's going to rat them out. People are going to help them. And arriving there is difficult, but oh, so satisfying. We have to also ensure that the parent partners feel safe and that they have ongoing support, not only from me as their supervisor, but also from the entire staff. So let's gather these threads together and examine how parent partners, family advocates, can enhance the work in the KDA arena. Going forward, we need to continue to collaborate to ensure that resources are utilized in the best possible way. Develop ways to triage families so the, possible, so the uh, right programs are getting to families at the right time. And Jennifer and I were talking about this in preparation for this webinar. We need to develop a way to say this family's needs really are better suited for mental health and pass them on to Jen. And Jen saying, you know what? Now they need the, the experience with somebody who knows the child welfare system and to help them with that system. And so we can kind of move people back and forth based on what their needs are. Again, remember, not one size fits all. We need to continue to grow and learn from one another. We need to inspire each other when things look a little tough with the vision. Work out the details because there will be details. And I want you to know that help is available. If you contact us, we'll have those conversations with you. We will um, guide you to, toward resources. We will do our very, very best to give you technical assistance. This kind of partnership is new and it's exciting and it's groundbreaking. But remember, as you start your own journey, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Thank you. Thanks so much to Judy and Jennifer and Mary for that, um, I, I would call it a very inspiring and thoughtful presentation. So that was great. Much appreciated. We will now move on to our next presenters from United Advocates for Children and Families. Uh, I would like to welcome Deborah Van Dunk. For over 30 years, Deborah has worked in the mental health field focusing on the education, support, and training of family members receiving services for children and youth in the mental health system. Deborah currently serves as the Technical Assistance Coordinator for Working Well Together, an organization that supports successful employment in the mental health workforce for people with lived experience. And joining Deborah today is Angela Brand. Angela is Director of Public Information and is responsible for the daily communications, marketing, and public relations efforts for UACF, as well as the Working Well Together Collaborative. These efforts provide information, resources, and supports for parents and parent partners in the mental health system, as well as information on the latest updates regarding children's mental health policy and legislative analysis. So Deborah and Angela, I turn it over to you to tell us more about UACF. Thanks. Thank you, Rich, and thank you for everyone who is listening in today. Um, I am Angela Brand, and as Rich said, we are from UACF. Um, a little bit of background on our organization. 
We are a statewide nonprofit. Our mission is to improve the quality of life for all children and youth with mental, emotional, and behavioral health challenges and to eliminate institutional discrimination and social stigma. Uh, that being said, the way we work is uh, statewide education, training, and technical assistance for both parents, caregivers, and families that are raising children and youth with mental health challenges, and also to parent partners and family advocates that are working in the public mental health system. Um, on the parent side, we work to support and advocate for the rights of parents. Um, as Mary was saying earlier, every family situation is unique. So our staff is made up of more than 50% uh, parents who have raised or are currently raising children in the mental health system, myself and Deborah are both parents. Um, we recognize that unique situation that families are in. There's a lot of stigma and shame that comes in from realizing that you have a child with a mental health a mental health need. So the way that we work to address that is to really support parents so that they understand the system. They understand what's happening with their child. They understand that it's not their fault and you know, often, especially when you're looking at the foster care system or child welfare, there's an additional stigma that's attached because the child's been removed from the home. So for us, we like to go in and explain to parents that this is a situational need and we're going to help them address it, whether it's through education, through training, or for some of our direct services. We have staff in Alameda County, for example. We work directly with those families um, in the ways that the ladies were explaining before, whether it's transportation or working in home care, how, however we need to support that family, we make that available. Um, on the, the professional side for the development for the parent partners and family advocates, we support them through various training programs that we offer to build their capacity, enhance their professional development. Um, it's, it's, a dual, it's a dual support system. Um, education, outreach, and direct services are really the three main prongs of how UACF operates. Um, Today, the biggest thing that we want to focus on is to really understand the role of parents and families as essential partners in the successful implementation of KDA. Its core practice model really stresses that family engagement is success, or, I'm sorry, <laughs> is essential for the success of this program. So we have several strategies that we do to work on that partnership between the families and the mental health departments. That, that a big bridge to that gap is our family partner, family advocate, parent partner however you might call it, that bridges that gap. Um, the lived experience, they can identify with the families on a peer level. Their knowledge of the system helps educate the families on a very personal level. Um, it's one thing to have someone come in and tell you the way that it's going to be. It's another to have someone come in and say, I've been there, I understand, here's where you need to go. Um, they'll help them understand the process, obtain resources, acting as if they're for lack of a better word, a translator or an interpreter, linking them up to the system. Um, the parent partners are really an instrumental piece of our family engagement strategy. Um, they work to provide that support. They're with the families every step of the way, and they ensure that they're supported, they're informed, and they're in control to ensure that their care is family-driven. Um, they do that through all different types of training and education, but it's, it's at every level. It's the doctor's office, the school system, the courtroom. Um, they really support those families to be active and effective participants in, in every level of decision making. Next we're going to talk about our parent and family engagement services we provide. UACF offers trainings for the development of parent partners that provide supportive and professional development for those who are working in the public mental health system. Some of our trainings that we offer and technical assistance is our Parent Partner 101, which is a basic training. And this training prepares the parent partners with lived experience to enter into the public mental health workforce. Uh, this training also is provided for parents in the community that may have an interest eventually in becoming a parent partner working for the public mental health system. We also have the Educating Equip and Support Training. This is a three-day train the trainer course. And this is offered to parent partner, family advocates, parents and caregivers with lived experience. And this training we offer, uh, we teach 
child mental health diagnosis. We train on special education, public uh, mental health system, medications. It's a very thorough training. After the three-day training, the participants in the training are asked to take an exam. Once they uh, pass the exam, there's certain criteria for them to pass the exam, they become certified. After they're certified, they take this curriculum and train parents in the communities, and it's a 12-week class, and this empowers the parents in the communities to be able to engage with the special education, with uh, the court system, um, with the child and family services team. We have received so much feedback from the parents after receiving this training, how they are, they feel so empowered and are able to articulate the needs for their children receiving services. For the advocacy and public policy support, we have an annual event including Legislative Advocacy Day and that's where we invite family advocate, parent partners and parents in different communities statewide to uh, participate in our Advocacy Day at the State Capitol here in Sacramento. We go through the legislative process and we then assign parent partners and parents that are available to speak before some of the legislators, but most of the time their admins, and talk about certain child mental health bills or concerns, and some of them even have a chance to tell their story. We also have a uh, Parent Empowerment, Empowerment Summit, and that is designed to advocate for families around public policy and how they can get uh, more involved in public policy. There is a KMACI conference that's held every year at Asilomar, and this is the California Mental Health Advocacy for Children and Youth, and this is a conference that's offered for parent partner, family advocates, uh, mental health providers, clinicians, where they have different work groups, and it's all centered around children's mental health. And UACF offers stipends for parents to attend this conference. Then we have our regional chapters, and this is, uh, currently we have uh, five chapters in Los Angeles, Imperial County, uh, Monterey County, and Sacramento. I also want to mention that um, UACF provides training for both parents and caregivers, as well as professional development for those working within the mental health system. Parent partner trainings and technical assistance are supportive resources designed to enhance professional development for parent partners working in the public mental health systems, preparing them as authentic partners in the community of agents and system transformation, community and change agents, I'm sorry, for system transformation. Some of the ways that we work through successful support of the parent, partner, and family advocate programs is to facilitate direct services for families um, in a way that promotes family engagement and positive outcomes. We have um, developed and supported parent, partner, and family advocate programs in Alameda County. Uh, we have the Alameda County Behavioral Health Family Partnership Program, Foster County Children's System of Care, as well as A Better Way, or the Parent Empowerment Program, PEP. Um, another thing that we offer specifically to ACF is our Parent Partner Coalition. It is a statewide network of folks working in the, as parent partners and family advocates. We have monthly calls where we will either present through UACF on things like public policy or legislative updates, budget analysis. More often than not, though, we have special speakers that will come in and talk to our parent partners and family advocates around the state regarding it's a lot, it's, it's based on feedback. What they want to know is what we provide. This last call on Tuesday, we had Patrick Gardner come in talking about the KDA update, letting everyone know kind of what was going on, what's happening um, through the process. We've had representatives from Kaiser, California Department of Education, Department of Healthcare Services. Um, it's, it's really 
interactive, it's engaging. Um, there's surveys that are conducted after every call so that feedback is given and we can then use that to further the, the next calls. Um, and through that, we can identify counties that may need training or technical assistance. We can identify certain things that are happening in counties and get that back out to our network. There's a lot of networking and shared information that, that takes place with the Parent Partner Coalition. Um, and then the big, the big way that we support is through our training and technical assistance. As Deborah mentioned, we offer several programs that are unique to UACF. Our Parent Partner Basic Training, PP101, Workforce Connection, our Educate, Equip, and Support, Ease, uh, Train the Trainer, and How to Tell Your Story, Train the Trainer. Um, our, our focus is really to build the capacity of those working in the public mental health system. In addition, um, our staff is heavily involved in attending statewide, statewide stakeholder meetings. Um, we bring that information back. We share it through things like the PPC network. We share it through our chapters. We let that information funnel through to the families. Um, but one of the biggest things that I'd like to highlight that we've done so far with the KDA piece is we have staff that were part of the KDA negotiation, te KDA negotiation team as well as the Joint Management Task Force. We did this to ensure that the parent voice was present and included, included during the development of the KDA implementation process. Um, our staff was participating in these meetings to offer the unique guidance um, and experience that they brought, making recommendations to result in improved support for children and families in their communities and access to appropriate and effective mental health systems. Um, Some of the um, involvement with Alameda County, the family engagement strategies and supports, is um, we have a parent that has been a part of this um, support team. And they provide our parents by training and education, uh, school, special education system, the KDA process. They prepare families to provide input at the behavior health care meetings and child and family service meetings. The um, collaborative management meeting attendee, which is one staff uh, in Alameda County, participates in these meetings. And from her participation in the meetings, because there's only one parent voice at the table, they have formed a subcommittee. And the Alameda County has developed this committee for family members so they're able to provide input into the KDA planning process. The subcommittee gets together. They Basically what they did was they looked at the core practice model. They identified areas of needed change, um, any guidance or recommendations um, that could be utilized for child welfare and mental health leadership to consider. Um, they provide assignments that, I'm sorry, the collaborative team will provide assignments or projects to this family subcommittee. They really use them as a pass-through. Um, they, they have ideas or thoughts. They'll want them to review something, and they will pass that down to the family involvement subcommittee, and then they'll bring back recommendations. Um, the way that the, the responsibility of involving the families is shared by both the subcommittee and the collaborative management teams. And this is really a big success story in terms of what Alameda County is doing because it's, there's family involvement from not just the decision making, but all the, way, all the way through. We can say that there's been a parent at the table, there's been a parent in the committee, there's been that voice that's been providing guidance um, every step along the way. Sam Mateo's uh, family engagement strategies, I've um, spoken to um, and offered technical assistance to one of the parents that have participated in the focus groups, and she shared with me that in the initial groups, the parents felt that the, uh, there needed to be training and technical assistance for the professionals to address trauma-informed uh, care. 
and also as well as the stigma and discrimination. Uh, and to be educated around all this, this is something that uh, parents statewide often talk to the staff at UACF regarding the stigma and discrimination, trauma-informed care, that they don't feel that the professionals have been trained and can really relate to their own personal experiences. They uh, also address concerns regarding the Child Welfare Agency. Uh, they didn't feel that they were accustomed to family, family participation. This is a huge concern because we feel and we stress to the parents, the parent partners and caregivers that they, their voice should be at the table at all times. They are the parents. They know their child better than anyone. So whatever type of services, whatever type of planning, meetings, treatment plans, we encourage that the parents are always at the table that their voice is heard, that they are um, really leading the plan, the program, whatever the meeting or whatever the uh, situation may be. Um, one of the purposes of the parent being at the table in the KDA meetings is to review forms, to add input, to the forms uh, to give any parent language to make it family friendly so that the parents can understand the forms. Also, one of the concerns is that when a parent, there's only one parent at the table in the majority of the counties that we've spoken to, and their concern is that when they're sick or when they're on vacation, there's no parent representation at the table. So they are requesting more than one parent to be chosen in each county to participate in these KDA meetings so they in turn can communicate this information to the parents and families that they serve. We have a quick reference. This last slide is just some of the resources that, that we often direct parents to. Um, our, our website, uh, UACF, has a KDA section, um, basic information, the core practice model, um, the implementation toolkit that's provided by CalSweat. CalSweat's also listed. Um, they have a phenomenal section, tons and tons of information. Um, a lot of our reference comes from there. The Young Minds Advocacy Project, um, as I said, Patrick Gardner was one of the pre uh, presenters on the last PPC call. They do a lot of work with KDA, bringing a lot of information out for families to access. And then um, Department of Healthcare Services, they also have quite a bit of information on their website as well. So it's, it's definitely, as it's been said before, it's a collaborative effort. Um, we all bring something to the table. So sharing these resources, making sure that they're available for the families and the parents, as well as the, the parent partners and family advocates is, is really critical to the success of this project. So I'd like to end this presentation by stating how important it is for the parents to be involved at the table at all levels and all meetings and that it's really crucial that we have parent partners representing the parent voice at all agencies. And the trainings that we mentioned today in our presentation, please feel free to contact myself and I'll be happy to direct you to the person that's providing the trainings. But we encourage all parent partner, family advocates, parents and caregivers with lived experience uh, to participate and learn these trainings. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah and Angela. Um, there was a lot of very valuable information in your presentation. I particularly uh, enjoyed the focus on um, working with um, the pro at both the program and policy levels and the importance as you uh, wrapped up your presentation, Deborah, of um, stating and emphasizing that we must have parents uh, involved at all levels in particular in these meetings where uh, policy and program decisions are being made. So I'd like to move on now to um, our Final presenters um, from Parents Anonymous, we have with us today Don Pickens and Michelle Allen. Don Pickens is the Program Director and Leadership Coordinator of Parents Anonymous, Inc., and currently serves on the Child Welfare Council. He also manages the California State Parent Leadership Team dedicated to public policy change. 
He is a skilled trainer and coach with expertise in diversity, fatherhood, health care, mental health, and child welfare. Joining Don will be Michelle Allen. Michelle is a family advocate who became a certified Parents Anonymous parent leader and started the first weekly support groups in Glen County for families involved with child welfare. Michelle serves as a member of the Glen County Mental Health Drug and Alcohol Board and the Children's Interagency Coordinating Council, and she has been active in the implementation of their MHSA plan. So, Don and Michelle, uh, take it away. Thank you, Rich. Our purpose here today from Parents Anonymous be to present meaningful, both meaningful parent and shared leadership with the essential components that produce positive change at the policy, program, and practice levels of pathways to well-being for our families and children. Next slide, please. In the KDA Radiant Assessment, the involvement of children and parents, children, youth, and families is necessary for the implementation of the core practice model. Our evidence-based adult peer-to-peer -peer support groups with children and youth for with children and youth groups that are operating in both large and small counties in California directly assess these two areas. Um, first is the services are tailored to meet individual child and family needs and reflect the child and family value. Also, peer support networks are available for children, youth, and caregivers. And that's where our adult and children's and youth programs really play a huge role. Next slide, please. Parents and, and Parents Anonymous, we've been, we've been strengthening families for over 45 years. Our mission is to ensure the meaningful shared leadership that results in better outcomes for families and communities by advocating implementing, evaluating across systems through evidence-based Parents Anonymous groups, National Parent Helpline, Shared Leadership in Action, and National Certification Leaders and Staff, which are a few of our programs. Next slide, please. Michelle, Michelle's going to uh, talk to you now about how we brought Parents Anonymous adult and children's programs to her county, Glenn County. Michelle? Okay, so um, are we gonna are we going to the next slide, or are we gonna just go into? Okay, so basically, I had attended a training that um, Don had presented up in Shasta County, and after going to that, I saw that it was something that we could really use in Glen County because I personally had been really involved in the mental health field side of things here in Glen County. And um, while I had, you know, done a lot with that side, I saw that there were a lot of families in the CPS side that really weren't getting a lot of services that they needed. And I thought that that would be something that would really be useful to the families here. So I brought it back to our, to our Children's Interagency Coordinating Council, which here is our Child Abuse Prevention Council and thought that that would be something that could really help because it was something that just all around is a good, it you know really showed the whole idea of shared leadership and just was a really good support group for everybody and I thought it would be really useful. So I went down and received the training and then brought it back and eventually we got it, we got it started. Because if you could go to the next slide. Oh, not the one I thought it was. Sorry. Um, because as you see, we've got the 10 steps of parent leadership, and you have the commitment to leadership, participation, and growing, exposure to other parents who demonstrate leadership behavior as acknowledged as leaders, encouragement for others to view parents as leaders, and then you continue to take action to receive supportive feedback and becoming a role model for other parents. And I just think that one of the things that we talk about in Parents Anonymous is the importance of everybody becoming leaders. And in a group, even though in our group currently I am the parent group leader, everybody has the opportunity to become a leader. And we have everybody's given parent leadership roles, even though they may not at this time be the parent group leader, everybody is recognized as a group leader at some point, or a parent leader in some role. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so in Parents Anonymous, 
we talk about effective shared effective shared leadership. It occurs when parents and staff work together to accomplish goals to bring better outcomes for children and families. In our process model, staff reaches sorry, staff reaches out to parents to invite them to participate in activities. And the parent decides to get involved for the betterment of the community and the family. And then they engage one another to access the skills and abilities they need to accomplish their goals. And in this, there is a partnership that forms where they use the skills and the abilities for better outcomes. So in our county, by forming our group, we got together and myself and David Press, who worked in the differential response group, um, I'm sorry, could you switch to the next slide? Oh, it's kind of a little late. So, this process model is going to work now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you go up, you get involved, then you become engaged, and then you form the partnership. So step one, step two, step three, step four. Sorry. Okay, so in our group, you see I am the trained parent group leader. And then David Press, who um, worked in our differential response agency, he is our trained group facilitator with me. And we went and got trained. And so we came back and we formed our group together. And so with our group, it's kind of unique because we are a small county. It doesn't run necessarily as a lot of the bigger counties run. But with me having my background in the mental health side, I'm able to bring uh, bring my experiences that I've had to a lot of the families that we have. Now, Parents Anonymous groups open to any parent who has any any parent any role as a parent. It could be somebody who is a fam who's a parent, a caregiver, any kind of a parental role. And we offer support to each other. And we go with them to court. We go with them. We offer support in any way whatsoever. And we have a trained facilitator there who comes and just offers, who gives guided support to me as the parent group leader. And basically, we are there to just give them whatever kind of support they need. Now, in our county, with me sitting on the Children's Interagency Coordinating Council, I am there to listen to what they say, and I bring that back to the county as, the, as their voice, as you say. So their concerns that they have is able to go back to the county. So when they have their issues and their concerns that's going on with their social workers, or if they're feeling that they're not being heard or whatever else, it's able to then go back to the county and they're able to then hear what's going on. So their concerns, and then we are able to bring to them the information in regards to KDA or whatever else. It's then able to go back to the county. So they are being heard, and they are they do get a chance to have an input into what's going on. So then we have, there is a children's um, and youth program where you have that so that while the parents are in their support group, you have a children's and youth support group as well. It's not just child care. It's an actually run program to where they are also receiving their own support group and their own support services while the parents are engaged in their support group. So it's their own trained there's trained people running the group, and they're receiving their support at the same time. Next slide. Go on. That's me. Michelle <laughs> just provided a, thank you, Michelle, provided a perfect example of how a parent can take charge to seek better outcomes in their community and community and, and uh, also to work with other agencies. She has uh, she started this she started this parents anonymous program by coming down to do our strategies training, matter of fact, which we're having again this July for agencies that would like to be affiliates of Parents Anonymous. And she has just absolutely taken it to her county and run with it. Uh, through this process also, Michelle has become a state parent leadership team member and serves on our KDA committee that that works through the Office of Child, and, Child Abuse and Prevention to uh, bring better outcomes and also to help policy change in her county. In this slide, the evidence-based results of Parents Anonymous 
are that our parents, we're the only parent partner program that's actually listed in the California Evidence-Based Clearinghouse. Um, the evidence base also proves that parents who continue to attend Parents Anonymous groups over time showed improvement in their child, treat, child maltreatment outcomes, risk and protective factors compared to those who dropped out. Uh, moving down, the, the next, the following bullet point is parents that reported that they shared a sense of purpose, belonging, and community, and were able to give and get help from other parents. That mutual support is so important. And I'll just take a minute to let you know my background is I came in as a, actually a foster care. I was a, I was a god, a, a father, who all of a sudden had a child on his door. His god, my my godchild, and mother couldn't take care of her anymore. And I had a seven-year-old child at 55 years of age, and I had no way, and she had mental health issues. I had, I had no skills. Parents Anonymous, by joining a Parents Anonymous group, we were able to find a way through the, actually through five, five systems that we had to operate, and the mutual support that I received from other parents, the parent group leader, also the group facilitator to provide me with resources was, was, was absolutely necessary for the, um, to pr produce the better outcomes for our family, for our fam for my family. And she's now just had her 14th birthday and she's doing well, extremely well. Bottom bullet point is new, our new research results that more mutual support provided in the Parents Anonymous groups statistically significantly increases family function and parental resilience for parents and caregivers. My case, is, is absolutely an evidence of that, and I visit groups all the time, and I deal with parents that the, the giving and the getting of support from other parents is what really helps these families thrive. Next slide, please. The uniqueness of, whoops, we missed one. The uniqueness of our program, again, I mentioned we have 45 years of family strengthening. It started with a parent and a social worker, which is, it started with shared leadership between these two, parent and staff, and it's always been that way in Parents Anonymous. We are culturally responsive. We're complementary to other programs to form a continuum of services. It is a trauma-informed practice. We're community-based, and most important, it's most important for me here is that long-term positive change for parents and their children. Next slide. National Parent Helpline, which also supports our adults and children's groups, um, is where parents can call in at any time um, when they're not in group and if they, just, if they just need more assistance or they need help. This is a linkages to other services. Um, it's also someone there who is professionally trained to be able to talk to parents um, when they're in very stressful situations and they don't, just don't know how to manage their children or their situation. Uh, it actually enhances both family strengthening, parental success, mental health, school net readiness and education, healthy lifestyles, and lastly, the empowerment of parents. The parents to be able to pick up a phone, to be able to call, to try and reach out for help is an important step in the process. Next slide, please. One last, I'd like to mention our National Certification of Parent Leaders. I think it's very important, especially for the implementation of KDA, is that you need strong parent leaders in order to be able to work with agencies and staff to implement KDA. And we have our National Certification of Parent Leaders where we certify parents. Um, it's a four-day train, four-day program, 32 hours um, actually in, in class, and another eight hours of that they get once, once they return home to what their actual situations. And to become a Parents Anonymous affiliate, there's one of two ways. You can either contact us directly, and as I mentioned before, we have an upcoming strategies for best practices for our affiliates happening on July 8th through the 11th. Thank you. And here's our contact information. And I did not, unfortunately, I don't have our website. In, I didn't have our website address in here, and it is just www parentsanonymous.org, and we'll give an explanation of all of our programs. Thanks, Rich.
Thank you, Don and Michelle, um, for that uh, excellent uh, presentation. I was really um, st struck by how you talked about um, building leadership in every parent. Makes me think about how everybody's got skills and strengths, and those can be channeled into leadership one way or another. And it was also refreshing to hear from a small county uh, presenting what's going on, since uh, in so many webinars, most of the presentation focus on the medium to larger size counties. So at this time, we will open it up to questions from the audience. And we are entertaining questions for the full presentation at this time. To ask a question, if you would please type it into the question box. And we will, um, re we will read those and um, have them answered by members of the panel. Do we have any questions, Camille? All right. Can we make it bigger? Well, you know, I have a question maybe to kick things off while we're waiting for other people to maybe come up with some questions. This is really for all three of you. Um, I, I know that uh, as we move forward with implementation of KDA, we're looking at both um, integrating youth voice with um, parent and family voice. And I wonder how any of you from your organizations have found, um, have there been challenges and successes that you've seen in your organization? in your organizations trying to blend sort of parent and family involvement with the youth involvement and youth engagement. Any examples um, of, of notable successes or challenges that you're aware of? Well, I don't know if this is going to um, address what you're asking, Rich, and please feel free to help me out here. But, you know, um, Philosophically, I think it's better to bring as many people to the table as we possibly can, to hear the voices. One of the things that we found in Contra Costa County was that we thought we had programs. And we thought that they were running the way they were intended to run. And we thought everything was just wonderful. And then when we started listening to the parents' voice, we found out, oh, that's not working so well. They haven't done that for years. There's no bus service there. Nobody can get to that. And we began to realize that these systems that we had set up, and we were pretty confident that we had set up good systems, that they weren't working the way they were intended to work. And that's also true for youth. You know, we, we think that we have opportunities, forums to hear them and to in involve them in the whole process. But sometimes there's a breakdown at the implementation level. And we don't know that because nobody tells us that. And I've got to be honest with you, sometimes when they do tell us, we get a little bit resistant and say, oh, no, that couldn't possibly be until we do our homework and figure out that's the way it is. But I think by hearing all those voices and making informed decisions on our part really strengthens and improves the work that we're doing. But it's really about gathering information from all our stakeholders and um, and being open to what they have to say. Does that clear things up a little bit? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and to build on that as well, because because of the, the collaborative nature of things, I look at our perspective at UACF, and you know, fortunately for us, we have, as I said before, we have a strong parent presence on our staff, both at UACF, also with our Alameda County um, parent partners, but. For us, luckily, we also have someone on our staff that is a youth that was involved in the foster care system. So it's very easy for us to say that we're going to empower the parents in this way and that way, but it's another to have her voice come in and say, and that's great for the parents, but from my personal experience, this is what I came up against. This is what I needed. So there's always that collaborative piece. And again, I don't know if that actually answered the question, but that's immediately what I thought of is that, you know, it, it's, it's all of us at that table talking about the strategies that are working in Contra Costa or Alameda or at UACF in our office looking at, it's one thing to look at it from the parent lens, which is what I do. It's another thing when we've got someone else on our staff looking at it through a youth who's been in the foster care system. We have another staff member who has children in her home that are part of the foster care system. So everyone's perspective 
blends in and, and we're all informed in a different way so we can all take pieces of that. And I think it was Jennifer that said earlier, it's, you're working with a family in this aspect for mental health and then you realize at some point they have to peel away and go over and work with somebody with juvenile justice background. I think it's kind of that same piece with the youth that trying to figure out how everyone's pieces are going to fit to that puzzle. And in, in Contra Costa, we do have um, a youth that sits on our KDA committee and we that really inspired us to hire a youth mentor, and we're in the process of doing that. So again, it's that um, it's a work in progress. We see a need, and then we have to kind of figure out a way to get that need met. But I think that this really enhances the work that we do and enhances our thinking every step of the way. Thanks, both of you. That was that was very informative, Camille. I think we have a couple of questions. The first question from Peggy. How challenging is it for agency staff to see parent partners as professional partners and not as on the side of parents? Well, it is a challenge because now not only are we talking about shared leadership, but we're talking about shared power. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a situation, in a system where people are used to having the power and giving permissions or giving instructions, it's quite different than it is when you're actually sharing the power with the other, the, the parent, the other person. When we uh, decided to bring parents um, into the parent partner program and the decision was made to co-locate the parent partners right in the county building, sitting there with social work staff, I got to tell you, it'd be nice to say everybody was like warm and loving and embracing and so anxious to have that happen, but really they had a lot of concerns. Are they going to steal my purse? Are we going to have to be concerned about the kind of uh, jokes we tell and the conversations we have? That's just honest. And so we tried to meet that. But you know, it was really kind of funny. I'm going to tell you just a little, little thing that happened to us. Um, we had people that complained about things like, their perfume was too strong. Now, they didn't come to me as the supervisor. They went right to our director to tell her. So we had to figure out a way that, because there was no room at the table. Nobody said, here, you know, have this seat, and, and you're going to be in full partnership. We had to kind of elbow our way in gently. And we decided what we're going to do is just win them over with kindness. And we tried to be helpful and kind and honest and engaging with the, the staff. And you know what? Eventually they came around because everybody's in this business because we want to help people. And these are our successes. These are the people that were able to, to meet their challenges and rebuild their lives. And these are the people to be proud of. So really we try to capitalize on these are our successes. And that seems to get people thinking about having parents co-located in a different way. That's great. Don and Michelle, I, I want to make sure you have an opportunity to uh, to speak up here. Did you have something that you wanted to add about the, the challenges involved in, in um, changing professionals' perspective around families? Something Absolutely. to add maybe from your experiences? Absolutely. Like I said, when I started this process, I was as a, as a, as a caregiver and then an adoptive father. And I've gone, actually, when navigating five systems, I've served on many of the st uh, local, county, and state uh, organizations, and in order to be able, accepted is the wrong is the wrong word. I think it's a, there's an understanding that parents are professionals in their experience, and sometimes that's very hard to get across to staff and agency, and that's why our, we have a, a shared leadership and action program that teaches both parents and staff to be able to work together, to understand that everyone brings those different qualities and abilities to the work of, of strengthening and making our, our families and communities better. So yes, it is, it's, it's a process that, that parents have to go through and will go through in order to fight through the systems to be able to help improve their communities but it is a very can be a very difficult process, and we as parents, and now myself also as staff, run into this on a very regular basis. But we're finding that with training and education, especially for parent leaders, to know how to operate within the system, it, it we can we can have very good results. Well, and to add to that, just recently when 
um, back in February when we had National Parent Leadership Month, I went to do a proclamation at the Board of Supervisors and we took parents with us and some of the parents were sitting there and when I went up to go present it and the Board of Supervisors came, I had all the parents go up with me and all the Board of Supervisors shook their hands and they were like, oh my gosh, these people just shook my hands. And I'm like, well, why wouldn't they? And they were just taken aback that the Board of Supervisors all shook their hands. And I'm like, you guys are no different than I am. Just because I'm the parent partner and I'm the you know, group leader, you are all the same as me. You could be the group leader. You could be the parent partner. You know, just because you're just new in your case doesn't make you any different than I am. Just give it a few months and then you could be where I am. And so I try and encourage the parents that are in group that, you know, you too can get here. It's just a matter of getting farther along in your case. And that's why I said we treat them all as you are all parent leaders. You're just not quite as far, you know, where you're at yet. But everybody's a leader. Everybody has this chance to get here. Thanks for sharing that, Michelle. I was going to add one more thing, too. This is Jennifer. And um, for Contra Costa County, it's been my experience that um, there were concerns at one point that maybe a family might, I mean, a family partner, parent partner might overline with a family member. However, through training, supervision, and supports, we're able to walk that fine line and to be balanced. And also that um, we work towards um, to collaborate with staff and with families and to work towards solutions. And I would also like to add that there's a difference between advocacy and adversarial. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we advocate for whatever it is the parent says they want. And if they say they want their child returned, the only way to get there is by following that case plan. So we're advocating for the case plan. Now, if they want a different outcome, we'll advocate for that. But uh, we're not going to advocate for any Thing that they just you know pull out of the air that you know just make the caseworker go away bring my child home and everything will be fine no we we have to advocate within the system that we're in and so we we don't align ourselves with the parents we align ourselves with what the parents say they want thanks Camille you want to go on to another question the next question is from Belinda are there any other counties thinking about investing in hiring youth partners or former foster youth to help the youth gain perspective in the CFT meetings? I'm not sure if, if uh, the mm -hmm. folks here would necessarily know, but do you, anybody here know about that? I'm not aware of it. Um, I know in Glen County we have um, peer mentors that work um, with, our, with our county very closely. Okay. That's fine. So let's, why don't we go on to the next question, Camille? The next question is from Sandra. Given that the adult attachment interview assessment tool is a strong predictor of an attachment style of offspring, is this tool or some other assessment instruments being used with biological and foster care parents or even with caregivers in order to address the specific therapeutic or psychoeducational needs of adults caring for children? Okay, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know that I know the answer to the question. That was, it was a fairly long question, but basically I think they're asking um, if you all are involved at all, I think, in um, giving input around um, uh, uh, assessment tools that counties might be using um, as they implement KDA. Has that been a part of discussion that uh, either you all at Parents Anonymous or UACF or in Contra Costa County um, have you been parties to discussions about the actual clinical um, tools that, that the counties are using? Anybody? No, we, ha we haven't in Parents Anonymous. Okay. So it may have come up with the Alameda County Subcommittee, but mm -hmm. it has not brought to our attention. It's been brought to our attention. Right. I think that this is, you know, I think it's a good question, and I think, you know, from my experience, this is an area that you know, it's probably still one of those doors that tends to remain a little closed um, to parent and family uh, and youth input is when you get really down in the weeds of like the clinical discussions uh, on the behavioral and mental health side. Uh, often parents aren't, may not be in the room in those discussions and that this, those discussions may be held exclusively among uh, folks with clinical 
training and background, and we may not always be taking into account the fact that some feedback or perspective from parents is important in selecting a, a tool. So uh, I think that's something for counties to be thinking about. The next question is from Belinda, and it's for Glenn County. Are your peer mentors former foster youth? Um, I am not sure currently if any of them are. Um, our peer mentors are the TAY age youth, and they are the 15 to 25 year olds. And they are, usually we try and pick people that are formally from the system, so they could be from the mental health system. So some of them could be foster youth. I'm not sure if they are or not. And um, well, Linda, this is Rich. Uh, uh, I just wanted to let you know that I am aware that there are other counties who are using um, fa former foster youth as peer mentors. Um, when the Contra Costa is about to hire somebody who most likely will be a former foster youth, and I know that Humboldt County uses um, uh, a number of, of uh, transition age youth and young adults who were formerly in the child welfare system. Um, in their um, uh, Humboldt County Transition Age Youth uh, Collaborative. And I believe San Bernardino County is also using youth in their system too. Thanks, Kim. Yeah. And then question, I mean, Peggy just had um, a statement, Northern California Training, Training Academy is working to incorporate former foster youth boys in social work basic training. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, um, I think it looks like we're, we're about wrapped up with the questions here, and so I'm going to turn it back over to um, Kim Mayer to close the, um, the webinar for today. Great. Thank you all so much for participating today. I want to thank our presenters, Rich Weiskall and Judy Niddle, Mary Lopez, Jennifer Tui Peloto, Deborah Van Dunk, Angela Brand, Don Pickens, and Michelle Allen for their really terrific presentations. And we hope that we were able to present both a county perspective, a state perspective, and, and a more of a national perspective to give um, support to how do we how we uh, include um, parents in this process. Um, so we're at the end of our time. You're going to get a survey as you exit the webinar. So we really hope you will fill that out and complete it. It helps give us feedback. Um, and with that, we'll conclude our broadcast. And thank you so much for joining us. Goodbye.